welcome to this uh, session on the role of intelligence uh, agencies. We have um, for some time now been uh, developing a, a quite comprehensive program on geopolitics and international security. And in that work, we have also been uh, moving towards uh, emphasizing and in interacting with people who are in the, uh, uh, in the area of intelligence, but also people who have opinions uh, on this. And we've got together a very interesting panel to help us discuss this today. We have uh, General Kjell Granhagen, who was, uh, until two weeks ago, head of the Norwegian Intelligence uh, Service, where he had for many years, and many years in which things were changing fast. So he has left the service. He's happy to speak about what happened in the service. <laughs> and uh, you can ask him all the questions he ever wanted to know about. Um, we also have uh, Nico Sell. Very happy to have you with us. She's the co-founder and co-chairman of Vicar. And if you don't know what that is, you will soon know. <laughs> but just one key is that she leads the largest group of um, uh, larger hacker community in the world, and uh, she is active in, uh, in hacking with a purpose. I think we'll hear more about that in a second. <laughs> um, we uh, have uh, John Chipman with us, a close friend and partner of the forum, uh, uh, head of the International Institute of Strategic Studies. He's been working on these issues for a long time as well. Very happy to have you with us. Minister Taro Kono, who is Minister, Minister for National Public Safety in the Cabinet Office of Japan. And of course, Japan, a country undergoing a major debate on its uh, security role in the world as well. And then we have uh, Jürgen Stock, who is the uh, Director, uh, Secretary General of Interpol, the International Criminal Police Organization based in Lyon. That's not an intelligence service. Yes. We agree that we should point out that this, they do not do intelligence. But of course, as police services and governments around the world, they will be recipients of information that is gathered through intelligence as well. And to chair us, uh, we have David Rothkopf, who is um, a chief executive officer and editor of for, for the Foreign Policy Group. Uh, uh, very happy to have you to chair this session. I would just say one sentence from my side as, uh, uh, as the managing board. I think the big question here is, are intelligence services too powerful or not powerful enough or both at the same time? Uh, when we had... Um, uh, when you have the Snowden revelations, a lot of people will go around saying, hey, how, what do, what's happening? Are they looking into my private communication? That can happen. We have to get it encrypted. We have to have rules of the game. And then there's a terrorist attack, and the same people are asking, how come you didn't pick up the planning for this, uh, uh, for this terrorist attack? Are, not, are you not doing your job? And we're confusing the people like uh, Granhagen, <laughs> although he's not easily confused, about this mixed message about how to deal with uh, intelligence and how to organize intelligence services. So that's the question. I will now shut up and leave it to David to run the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, welcome to all of you. Uh, it, this promises to be a very interesting discussion. I've been given very, very uh, broad uh, ambit for it to go, but there's been one very specific request, and that is that all of you vote before we begin um, on whether intelligence services are too powerful or not powerful enough. And I believe you can do this by going to uh, wef.ch slash vote, and then you'll have the opportunity to vote, and within seconds or minutes or a couple of days, we'll, we'll know what the answer is, <laughs> and we'll see where you stand on this issue. Uh, and as you do the voting, uh, I'll explain that we're first going to talk a little bit about whether intelligence capabilities are sufficient to keep us safe from the threats that we perceive are the greatest threats. And then we're going to try to move into next generation threats next generation capabilities, and what the evolving social compact is uh, in this new uh, uh, information age uh, in which uh, between big data uh, and the proliferation of smart devices in the world, uh, almost everyone is carrying with them useful intelligence, uh, and therefore almost everyone becomes a potential target of uh, intelligence uh, inquiries. Um, uh, I, I should say I'm a little hesitant um, about this because I do see some friends here in the audience like John Negroponte, who used to be the director of national intelligence in the United States. Um, 
And, uh, and so it's going to be very difficult to glide over the issues here. And I hope that we have a, you know, in, uh, in-depth conversation. Um, I'm not sure when exactly the, the numbers come up, uh, but, uh, oh, well, there, that, that part. Uh, so 71% of you um, say that intelligence services are not powerful enough. I, I wonder if we held this in the village of Davos or somewhere off this mountain, <coughs> whether we'd get exactly the same result. Uh, I suspect not. Uh, and that may be telling in and of itself. <coughs> Jurgen, let me start with you in the context of this. Um, uh, I think it's very useful to have the head of a police organization, particularly one as distinguished as Interpol here, um, because in combating the threats that we hear the most about, uh, the police play an absolutely central role, and the coordination between intelligence services and police is an extremely sensitive and complex issue. Do you think, particularly in like, a light of the recent developments in Europe, that that is, is working, the tools are in place, the intelligence services are powerful enough to actually support the needs of the police? Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank Espen for, for highlighting that I'm not representing the intelligence services, but, uh, but the police. Um, Interpol is, uh, I'd like to highlight that before I start, is uh, connecting 190 member countries, so mainly the police services. These are our main counterparts. We are um, providing information. We build capacity, which is a, a big issue um, to fight the global phenomena. We train police officers. We coordinate cross-border operations, uh, but we don't have any executive powers. I think that's important uh, to understand uh, the mechanism, but we, we support police to cooperate internationally and to share information. And I think my most important point today is to, maybe not to talk about how powerful we are, but the question, could we be more effective if would we be better in sharing the information that is available? Of course, it's not a, a totally new topic, as we are all aware. We've been discussing that for a number of years, that we have to be better in sharing. And, and my main point is we need to be better in sh not just in sharing, but also in sharing specific information on a multilateral level. Why? Just give you an example I, I learned uh, quite recently uh, in, in Belgium. Um, somebody, a, a police officer on the street, made an arrest uh, and uh, checked the name of the person. And uh, he became aware that this person was wanted by South Africa for uh, a major offense. I think this example shows that uh, the issues we are talking about really are global now, and they show how, how effective our system is if we are going to share the, the relevant information, not just bilaterally, but using the multilateral, multilateral platforms we have. So this is exactly what the UN Security Council highlighted in its resolution 2178, use the already existing global platforms to share your information. Two examples, then I stop. We have about 6,000 profiles of foreign terrorist fighters in our databases. It's important that this information is available not just at the level of the specialized units, but also at the levels of border stations and even the patrol officer in his car at the street who makes checks, checks person, checks cars, need to have access to this important information. The patrol officer on the street needs to be seen as a part of an early warning system. Second example, we have a... Before you go, I want to ask a question. You say 6,000. To the average person in the audience, is that a large number or a small number? It's there are 30,000 people in ISIS. We started, That's one we started of one with, terrorist group. We so started with 13 profiles a couple of years ago when we opened <laughs> this database. So with the support from, from many governments, police services, We've been able to increase this number to 6,000. We know the official numbers of foreign terrorist fighters are around 30,000. <laughs> I want to have all the 30,000 profiles in the Interpol database to be accessible on a global scale. I just scale. want to establish it's a fraction of the It's a fraction. Right, You're right. Right, right. Second example, um, we, have, we have a database um, called the SLDD, Stolen Lost Travel Documents. More than 55 million stolen and lost travel documents, amongst them several thousand from the conflict zone in Syria and Iraq, are part of this database. And we can, we can see how effective the system can be, a global system can be, if a border police officer has access to this information or a police officer on the street has access to, in, to this information, really to build a global network to effectively fight a global threat. 
General. I was very pleased to hear that you're now going to be able to open up all the secrets <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that you wouldn't have been able to talk about two weeks ago. Are we over-focused on terrorism in our intelligence efforts? I think it's, um, it's important to, to be aware that the intelligence agencies have, have different types of tasks. Um, uh, obviously, we are expected to uh, warn our authorities on threats like terrorism, uh, like threat in, in cyberspace, um, military threats against our countries. Uh, but all, we are also, on a general basis, going to keep uh, our uh, authorities informed about the global situation, uh, this, the development in various regions, uh, in order to prepare them uh, for the best possible decisions. So there, there, there are a number of tasks uh, in which um, intelligence services are involved. N Nico, just as we're beginning our sort of our, our survey here, um, I'd like your reaction to the poll. Um. It doesn't shock me necessarily, given this group. I think. Um, and what do you mean by this group? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think most people here haven't been lucky enough to be educated by the best hackers in the world. Um, you know, if once you've been to DEF CON, you learn some things. Actually, there's about 70 nation states that send spies to DEF CON every year, and they tell, learn. Tell everybody what DEF CON is. And DEF CON is the largest hacker community in the world, but we have a gathering in Vegas every year where hackers come in and disclose vulnerabilities in systems to everyone at once, the entire world. Um, there are heroes, really. They're the whistleblowers blowers <laughs> fighting this. And, um, and it's really important that when we find vulnerabilities in systems, that everybody knows about it at once, because the web is a global resource. And one of the ways that I see intelligence grabbing power that I don't think is good for any of us is by hoarding zero days. So they find, zero, they find a vulnerability in systems, and they use them and hide them for their own offense. And that makes us all less secure. And I think we as a global society need to come together and fix these systems as once, because we're all sharing the same system. All right, well that's one area where there's some concern about the reach of governments. There is a debate going on in Japan about the reach of governments. To make the case that the governments like the Japanese government need more authority and, mm -hmm. and more capability uh, than they currently have. Well, um, my name is Taro Kono, head of the Japan's National Police Organization. In Japan, we don't have an intelligence agency, so the police organization does intelligence and the law enforcement. Um, for some European countries, uh, they wanted to separate the intelligence and the law enforcement for some historic reasons. And Japan, for some historic reasons, we wanted to put uh, law enforcement intelligence together under the democratic police force. Um, Japan is island country, and we are relatively homogeneous people. And the Japanese language is a very strong barrier at one time. But now, <coughs> Terrorists could use <coughs> cyber to attack the critical infrastructure. And uh, you have a Google translator, so the language is not a barrier. And we have 20 million foreign travelers to Japan every year. So we, we are facing more threat for terrorism. And the Japanese police force is not allowed to wiretap. Well, we could to uh, wiretap to investigate uh, crimes already committed. And we, we usually do 10 wiretapping a year. And uh, conspiracy is not a crime in Japan. So we are not uh, able to participate in UN <coughs> Transnational Organized Crime Convention because we don't have uh, conspiracy laws. Uh, the Japanese people and a lot of media have been happy with it. But uh, because of the terrorism attack in Paris and all those cyber crimes, we are now thinking, are we ready? Or is Japanese police organization strong enough to fend off terrorism? We are hosting G7 summit and the ministerial meetings in Japan this year. And 2020 Olympic game is coming up. So we are at the crossroad. Should we 
increase uh, capability or should we be content with what we have? There is uh, um, unequal distribution among the countries of the world of intelligence capabilities and uh, access to data. The UK, the US, Five I countries have uh, special superpower status in this intelligence world. Talk a little bit about what you see as the responsibilities and challenges that go with that status. Certainly. Well, first to begin, I think, uh, to make the point that um, there's no international law that governs international espionage. There's an international law on, on armed conflict. There's international law of the sea. Uh, there's international law on humanitarian intervention. Uh, but there's no international law that prohibits international uh, espionage. So the constraint, legal constraint, on any intelligence service is uniquely the constraint that the host country, the domestic legal system, places on itself. So some countries, going to the point of whether they're powerful or not, um, have no domestic uh, legal constraint on the operation of their intelligence services. I would imagine that's the case with, with North Korea. Uh, other countries, like the uh, United States and the United Kingdom, have a fairly elaborate domestic uh, uh, legal structure for what their intelligence agents can and cannot do. Going to Mr. Kono's point about uh, your 10 uh, wiretaps a, a year, the uh, UK Home Secretary will probably sign about 2,000 uh, warrants a year, so that's several every day. Uh, in order to allow um, MI5 to intercept traffic. Uh, the United Kingdom has a comparative advantage because in the last century they laid uh, the fiber optic cables. Cable and wireless did that. So the United Kingdom's GCHQ, along with uh, the US uh, uh, National uh, Security Agency and the uh, intelligence agencies of Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, between them, uh, they really have all uh, a high percentage of the, of the state manufactured uh, signals intelligence uh, uh, in the world. And I think since Snowden, uh, certainly in the United States and recently in the United Kingdom, how high a percentage? there has been, how, how? I, 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 did, I, I wouldn't, I would put it over 85%, right, I right, would imagine. Right. No, I, I just want uh, people uh, to have though a it, sense Though of it's important to say that any country that has a um, uh, national uh, telecommunications uh, network has a nascent signals intelligence capacity uh, of its own. So the uh, unique qualities that the Five Eyes had, and especially the United Kingdom and the United States, are now more heavily distributed amongst uh, other countries that have uh, national telecommunications networks and an ability to uh, to, to, to engage in some signals intelligence activity, which in the past they might not have been uh, able to do. But we are now in the United Kingdom in the midst of, a, of an intense debate. Uh, we are going to pass a new bill in Parliament, the draft investigatory powers bill, uh, that now has a kind of double lock system uh, uh, in order to ensure that we have a stronger covenant between the intelligence services and our public opinion. There will be a ministerial signature required and also a, a, a judicial uh, second uh, opinion required before um, uh, warrants uh, are issued. There will be exceptions for national security where if the, uh, in the celebrated phrase, the Home Secretary or the Foreign Secretary is woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning, he can sign a warrant, but within five days uh, a judicial review has to take place that that warrant was properly uh, procured. So the domestic uh, legal uh, environment uh, in the United States and the United Kingdom, I think, is becoming stronger and needs to become stronger in order to have uh, that public support for the intelligence activity that still needs to take place to secure our citizens. So we, see, we, we seem to be at a, I'll, I mean, I'll come to you in a second, but it's, we seem to be at a kind of a, a moment of some tension here uh, in, in, in the sense that uh, in terms of uh, the intelligence that we've got, in, in terms of threats like terrorist threat, we may not have enough. Uh, we, we are growing, but there's still a significant amount to go. In certain countries, such as Japan, there are severe constraints on the government uh, in terms of protecting themselves. Um, meanwhile, capabilities are proliferating uh, rapidly as a result of technological changes. Um, and uh, new uh, data sources that may be of interest are proliferating. We're going through whatever it is, 20 billion devices on the internet, uh, 50 billion by 2020. Uh, it, it just changes the landscape in terms of all of this. As John points out, there's no international law affecting espionage. There's not even a clear definition of what espionage is. In fact, you know, in a sort of celebrated moment before the U.S. Congress a few months ago, uh, the, the, uh, 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 John Clapper sat in front of the, the Congress and said, 
you know, that a, a whole group of things that might be described as espionage were just really the way countries go about their business nowadays. Uh, and, and we're in this kind of definitional phase. You know, what is, what is really intel uh, spying? What isn't spying? What's normal? What's not normal? And I, and I, I, I wanted to turn to you, Nico, and you, you, you seem to have a, a comment you want to throw in, so feel free to do that. But we seem to be at a at sort of a technological turning point for the planet, and we haven't really had a debate about the underlying philosophical and legal parameters with which we should be operating beyond that turning point. And I'm, I'm just sort of wondering what your view is on that. Um, I, I agree. I think with um, intelligence and law enforcement, you have to be really careful what you wish for here because I think by getting more power in ways like with the investigatory act, um, which is would make Wicker, my company, illegal um, in your country, um, actually harms us more. So one of the most important lessons I learned was from Thomas Cross a very famous hacker in 2009, he taught us all how to break into lawful intercept machines. And at that point, it was very clear that a backdoor for the good guys will always equal a backdoor for the bad guys. In fact, I think this is such an important lesson that we brought him back to teach the kids how to break into lawful intercept machines this year. So by giving yourselves wiretap power or more power, you're actually causing more security harm than good. And I think if you take it a step further with the crypto wars in the 60s and 70s, was a very different time. We're a global corporation right now and we're all connected. So let's just play this out a little bit. We give the UK a backdoor because we trust the UK. We've got, you know, we're friends with you guys. Or uh, let's say the US, right? Do we trust them with the master keys? They weren't able to keep spies' entire sexual history records safe, <laughs> right? With the OPM breach. Like how could they keep keys safe? But then let's say, okay, let's get back that. Okay, well now we've set precedent that the UK, we have to give a back door to the UK. And then we have to give a back door to China. And before you know it, there are keys all over the place and it's made the entire internet way less secure. Could I put the, uh, uh, the, the, the other point of principle here, uh, which is um, that uh, we still live uh, in a world of states uh, governments uh, ha owe a duty of care to their citizens, and the citizens expect uh, their states uh, within uh, a clear legal context to be able to protect them. Uh, public hi highways are surveyed, uh, all sorts of uh, things are surveyed every day. The question of principle is whether the internet should become a no-go area for governments or an area in which the governments don't have a particular right to intervene in order to regulate the, the, well, the legal activity as between their citizens or citizens of, of, of other countries. Uh, and I think there is an important philosophical uh, point there. My judgment is uh, that in carefully circumscribed uh, circumstances, governments should be able uh, to understand what citizens are doing uh, on uh, the internet when it affects uh, public uh, security. On the question here well, of well, uh, how one deals with, with, with difficult Excuse governments, me, the question is not to apply a double standard, but a single standard. So if you trust the domestic regulation of the United Kingdom to know that these back doors will be used in only very circumscribed areas, Areas, you might be able to uh, uh, justify to yourself why that is done and still have an answer to the North Koreans as to why you wouldn't provide a backdoor to them because their domestic legal structure is not okay. the well, same. Well, there, there, there are other questions of principle, too. And one of them, uh, which relates to your point, is protect what? Um, protect whom? Protect whom from what? Um, and so uh, everybody walks around, you know, in my mind, the image is a little bit like from a Peanuts comic. Do you remember the old Peanuts comic? There was a character named Pigpen, and Pigpen walked around and there was a little cloud of dust at his feet. And this is what we all look like in data terms. We're walking around and we're throwing off all this data all the time. And well, the question is, whose data is that? Is it the person who's throwing it off? Is it the company that's collecting it? Is it the government in which the data is being thrown off? Is it anybody who has an interest in that data? Since that data is the foundational element of the global economy going forward, it's the basic unit of economic measure of the global economy, it has a value. <coughs> who gets that value? Privacy laws make the decision about who gets that value. And you have the US heading off in one direction with a privacy standard, the Europeans heading in another direction with a privacy standard, a whole set of other countries that are more authoritarian in a yet another direction with privacy standards. And so we have to answer multiple questions of principle. Um, 
are we getting precariously close to a point where this debate is going to make people um, more dangerous, uh, more, more uh, at risk in your view in terms of, of, of terror threats? Or is this precisely the right debate to be having right now? I think that the debate, right, of course the police operates in, in, in most and in all of our member countries in a, in a strict legal framework. Also that the sharing internationally is, there is of course a law allowing to share or not allowing to share, so it depends on the legal framework. To a certain extent, as we know, it depends also, let's say, on the commitment to share, uh, that the cultural background may be, so, so there are still opportunities uh, in the already existing system to be more effective. That the question you raised, of course, that's something the lawmakers have to decide at the end. I think it's the police role to identify gaps in, in our work. So when I was a young police officer, of course, it was, I was able, uh, on the basis of a court order, to search houses, to take uh, records, to take, it was most of the time it was paperwork, which then we, we read. Nowadays, uh, in, in the light of encryption, anonymization, of course, we have problems, and we have to tell the lawmakers that at a certain point we, we can't start investigations or we have to stop investigations. Take the example of child exploitation in the internet. Without certain information, we, we are not able to do anything to get behind uh, the, the criminals. So this is something we have to explain. Uh, uh, we, I think we all remember the director of the, of the FBI, uh, Jim Comey, raising the discussion in the US about going dark, which is a, is a, a major issue, and we have to identify these gaps but of course, at the end, it's, it's a decision that has to be taken by the lawmakers, but it requires a debate on, on, on privacy issue on the one hand and, and security gaps uh, on the other hand and balancing these interests. And of I course, as law enforcement, completely. we understand that. Don't, it's, it's very misleading and unproductive to say that privacy and security are on opposite <coughs> teams. They're on the same team. And by yeah. having private communications, we are all more secure. Spies use Wicker every day to fight terrorists. It's no different than a teenager's private communications. Yeah, but again, without, uh, you, you can't have security without privacy and the other way around, two sides of a medal, of course. So it's not to, to play well, but, but one against the other, but if, of course, the, I think the challenge is to balance these interests in light of huge technological developments that's going on. And again, the police role is to identify gaps where we can't continue investigating or where we can close security gaps or prevent terrorist attacks from right. taking but place. We're also, we, we, we have to face the same things that we've been facing with policing from the beginning of time, which is crime is a yep. rare occurrence, and there are other things that are day-to-day -day occurrences which deserve protection within that context, uh, <laughs> even more so because they happen more frequently. General, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, uh, well, I, I was not surprised by the result of the, the, the little poll you made here uh, with four out of five um, saying that intelligence agencies are not powerful um, enough. I think there is a, uh, and I think you would probably um, have the same uh, answer also if you uh, asked the broader public. Uh, we've, we've made polls in Norway on, of the, on the confidence of intelligence service and police security services, and it's pretty high. Uh, people in general want to uh, ensure national security. They want to ensure uh, public security. And in a changing world, I think they realize that intelligence services need to be empowered uh, um, to do that. There will always be discussions to what extent uh, should intelligence and security services be allowed to do that. I think we need that discussion. I think it's extremely important that there is uh, transparency. If, if anything good came out of Snowden, I think um, the good thing was that I think uh, leaders in intelligence and security services today realize that there has to be a dialogue on these issues. They will never go into details on methods and sources and capabilities, but there needs to be a discussion and there needs to be an understanding in general on how uh, these services uh, operate in executing their very important work on behalf of society. Do you agree? <laughs> Well, I, th I think in, in Japan, the debate is still lagging behind. We are debating what needs to be protected. Uh, some people say, we say we need to protect people. Some people say we need to protect constitution. <clears throat> the Japanese constitution, the interpretation of the Japanese constitution was we don't have collective defense. So Japan has to defend our country independently. And this year, last year, 
we finally change the interpretation, we could, you, we could allow government to exercise power of collective defense to defend Japan. So the next step is, okay, what are we going to defend against the terrorism? Uh, I think we need to tell people the real threat is coming from terrorism. It's, it's right there. It's a clear and present danger. And the, the law enforcement or intelligence community need to have more power to deal with it. And people still may not believe it. So the poll was very shocking to me. I thought it would, it would have been overwhelmingly the intelligence community today is too powerful, but it was totally opposite. So I think we still need well, to it's talk possible to possible that people. audiences at Davos well, could yeah, be, I, I, could I be hope wrong that's the case. That I hope I really hope that's the case. <laughs> I think we still need to talk to our people that this is a danger we are facing, and this is what we need to do, and we really need to convince it. So it was. Uh, I think Japan may be in a different league. Okay, let me ask you two questions: a short one and a longer one. The short one is: if this poll were taken in the UK more broadly. Would you get the result that the general thinks he would get if he were taking it back home in Norway? Yes. You think the general public would be broadly supportive of stronger intelligence services? Well, what the general public supports is the quality of the intelligence service in the UK. There was, in fact, a poll taken in the UK, and I think something like 72% mm -hmm. of the British public thought that their intelligence services uh, performed a proper and proportionate uh, role. So there is strong public support in the United Kingdom for the, the intelligence service. Okay, so as we move forward into the the, the, the world of the future. One of the things that I see is that I think we've spent the first sort of 15 years of the 21st century fighting the last wars of the 20th century, and that a lot of the terrorism that we see is a manifestation of certain parts of the world to keep up with progress, and it's produced unrest, and it has spread out consequences for all of us. But that as we get into the 21st century, a whole set of new issues and threats and opportunities emerge from a wired world, a world where in five, six, seven, ten years from now, the vast majority of people on the planet are going to be connected in a man-made system for the first time. Almost all of economic activity is going to take place inside that system. It's going to change in its nature. Uh, education, the delivery of government services, uh, essentially everything is going to take place within that system. And so we need to develop new rules of the road to address those 21st century um, challenges uh, as, as opposed to over-focusing the structure of the intelligence community on 20th century challenges. What do you see as the new challenges emerging from the 21st century that ought to be coloring this discussion uh, as much as perhaps our concern about terror? Well, the principal change in the uh, role of intelligence agencies has been uh, from a near exclusive focus on interstate uh, espionage and trying to discover secrets that are actually being uh, held by governments uh, to addressing many of these transnational issues that on occasion requires intercepting the communications of individuals or groups that are uh, non-state uh, actors and the proliferation of these means of communication and the variety of instruments that are being used that put enormous pressures uh, on intelligence agencies. Uh, but I would add the point that hasn't yet been made, that while there's an extraordinary <coughs> amount of signals intelligence and national technical means that goes on, uh, the bigger intelligence agencies and the better intelligence agencies still need to rely a great deal on, on human intelligence and the human intelligence um, task today is extraordinarily challenging, given the difficulty of penetrating non-state actors as, a point, as, a po as opposed to penetrating state actors. During the Cold War, uh, inserting an agent uh, uh, in Warsaw or in Moscow was a, a doable affair. There, were, there, there, there was tradecraft that could do that. You could bribe people and the like. Uh, now, when you think of uh, the challenges that a British national would have, uh, inserting himself into an ISIL network in Syria and getting trusted by that network and after a period of time being able credibly to report back what their plans were, those are very uh, challenging uh, tasks. And I think there will be very few intelligence agencies in the world, including the very uh, best ones, that will be able to insert human agents in a in the variety of transnational uh, activities that are that are being taken. So I think that will be a big pressure and will make people judge uh, that the challenges on intelligence agencies are really very large today and much larger than they were in the past. Okay, well that's a challenge to intelligence agencies. What do you see as emerging challenges associated with this kind of 
uh, quantum leap that we're in the midst of making uh, in terms of the nature of life in the connected world? Uh, well, let me agree with John for a minute. So. <laughs> that was something um, we didn't expect to happen here today. So. Uh, which is um, at DEF CON every year, Chris Hagnagy hosts a contest called the Social Engineering Contest. And they get 100% of the targets 100% of the time. And they don't even need to send agents away. They use the phone and Facebook. And through those two pieces of information alone, they're able to manipulate people to get the information they want. And this is the kind of tool that people and intelligence world should and can use instead of putting holes in our systems and our private communications that both threatens human rights and threatens the people fighting the terrorists. I think um, on the other end of it, um, something that we keep track of really closely is, again, private communications and looking around the world at where it's potentially illegal or not illegal. And um, it almost maps exactly to the totalitarian regimes. These are the places where they are surveilling their citizens on a daily basis. And I always say, UK, really, you want to join the red team? Um, because you're not usually on that side, uh, right? But we can use the, the governments that are surveilling their people every day. We can use that against them. And we should. I think that's an unfair comment in a way because, you know, when, when the... I'm uh, glad we're returning to normal here. Well, uh, you know, look, um, in the United States in the 1950s, uh, the FBI had the authority, if it sought a judicial warrant, uh, to intercept a first-class piece of post, steam open the envelope, read the communication, put the uh, um, letter back in the post, re-steam it, and send it on its way. And it would do that rarely and only when it was able to get a judicial warrant. And the debate about privacy and security uh, in the United States was uh, not what it is today. This difference in technology has changed the intensity and nature of the debate. But the issue of principle is still the same. Can democratically elected governments in carefully circumscribed circumstances uh, intercept a communication in order to prevent uh, a horrific uh, breach of law or, or public safety. And I think that democratic societies would wish those governments to do this in these circumscribed ways. And total privacy in but, the but internet the, but, is not compatible but, right, with Right, right. Uh, but there was a phrase in what you just said, which was in carefully circumscribed ways, which is That's actually... That's we have in, in the well, United Kingdom. The U United okay, Kingdom well, is not me, joining okay, uh, authoritarian government. Okay, it's well, got a very rigorous let, let domestic Let me talk about a government uh, that's law, not authoritarian. But, but has not done it in circumscribed ways, and that's the government of the United States, which seems to have determined that the Fourth Amendment doesn't cover metadata, and yet metadata is the, precisely the kind of thing that you might have found in a notebook in the 1950s at the time that you were steaming this open. And because it determined that it did not cover metadata, it therefore allowed the mass warehousing of certain kinds of information in not circumscribed ways. And that illustrates precisely the tension that we are dealing with here, um, partially because a lot of lawmakers, a lot of the people who are supposed to be grappling with these problems, don't even understand the core issues. They don't have the ability to have the conversation. I had a conversation once with a guy who was a former uh, top US intelligence official, former CIA director, and he said he used to go in and brief the cabinet or the, the National Security Council on these issues, and he said they looked at him like he was Rain Man, <laughs> like he was speaking, and they were not understanding his words. Does the, does, does, does the newness of some of these issues uh, affect the competency of lawmakers to actually make uh, reasonable judgments ar around these questions? Maybe I think it's, it's the role, again, of, of law enforcement, and to limit my comment on the role of law enforcement, to identify the gaps we have. And I, I fully share your view. In the, in the past, we've been able to do, on the basis of court order, things we can't do today. And again, encryption, anonymization, mass data, these are the huge problems all around the globe in, in effectively um, doing law enforcement and, and, and catch the criminals. And there is transition going on. So we need to develop, let's say, a criminalistic 4.0 now following these huge technological developments. And, and they don't wait um, until decisions are made or new law is established in, in the member countries. The developments going on, we, we heard a lot here during the days in Davos about Industry 4.0, the smart car, smart home, the, the, in, the internet of everything. So that provides huge opportunities for criminals to attack our systems, our private computers, 
our, our critical infrastructures. And, and of course, terrorists can make use of this. As we see that the underground economy is now more and more professional. You don't need to be an expert to attack a system. I could do that simply sitting on the couch on my sofa and buying the stuff from the underground economy in the internet. I think this is the threat what we are talking about. And that leads to the difficult, again, the difficult discussions to balance, to balance freedom and security and, and, and that, that's the challenge for all our societies. But again, technology, the, the te technology moves forward and, and we, we try to do our job in protecting societies and, and that's the difficulty at okay, this Okay, he stage. avoided my question altogether. <laughs> so, 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 no, and congratulations, that's your job to avoid the question. But, but, but I wanna try, you're now two, two weeks out of this job, um, so I'm sure you're gonna be completely open with me here. Um, are there issues of competency within senior government officials about understanding the nature of these technological challenges? It is difficult, I mean, uh, but I think uh, from my experience, I think we've had a good dialogue with our authorities on this, and I think the, 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 the methods and the, the work of intelligence services is, very, is pretty good, pretty well understood uh, in the Norwegian government. But, but let me make another comment because you, you introduced um, the, 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 the term of metadata here. Uh, with the, um, the challenges that we face, both when it comes to international terrorism and in uh, cyberspace, the problem is not to identify the known actors. The known actors are easy to monitor, they're easy to find uh, out there. The problem is the actors uh, that we don't know about. Um, terrorist, terrorism as a phenomenon has changed radically over the last three or four years, uh, at least here in, in, in Europe. Um, uh, before, it used to be something that happened out there uh, and was prepared out there in the world that was, it was then exported into our uh, home countries. Today, we have the, 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 the um, uh, phenomena of jihadism, and we have the remote radicalization of people in our home uh, countries. We don't know the actors in, in, in this play, and in order to identify them, if we didn't have the possibility to use metadata, uh, we would be absolutely in the black. But in the same way, when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, the serious cyber threats against our uh, governments, about, uh, against our societies, if we weren't able uh, to uh, use uh, the access to metadata, uh, we would be completely blind. So uh, we, we have to be uh, honest about these things. Uh, we cannot solve all problems. I, I've heard politicians saying well, that we, we will give uh, uh, intelligence services the tools that they need. Well, uh, uh, but uh, we need to understand that dealing with the unpredictable, dealing with the unknown threats is a very difficult matter. But, well, yes, but I mean, you, you're making a good case, but I think a, 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 it, it suggests that a, a debate ought to take place about Absolutely. this, a public debate Absolutely. about it. And the level of awareness within the public about the nature of these issues is quite low. And, and so that creates, a, that creates a problem associated with it. Um, Nico, you want to jump in? I'm going to come to you in a second. I'm going to come to both of you in a second. I want to come back to something. And I'd like you to think a little bit about the hierarchy of threats. Every time I sit in a discussion about the requirement that we have massive intelligence capabilities and surveillance, the example that's always given is terrorism. Terrorism is not an existential threat to any major country in the world. Terrorism has a, you know, takes a toll in the last year, 20 or 30,000 people. It's tragic. Most of it is in a handful of countries. The number of times it affects most of the rest of the world is extremely limited. There are other greater threats that are out there, whether they're traditional geopolitical threats or cyber crime or other kinds of... And I'd like to talk a little bit about the hierarchy of threats and whether we're letting one particular kind of threat drive this discussion too much. Yeah. All right, so there are, I would say, three secure messaging apps in the world that I would trust. Of those, Wicker is the only one that doesn't have any metadata attached to it. In other words, we can't even tell who our users are, who they're talking to, when or how often. We're the only one in the world that does that. That's why all the spies use us. That's why they're not using the other encryption techniques. 
because this is very important for spies and human rights activists. It's a key, key tool. And then I guess going back what to John said with Hoover and the FBI, I consider that a huge stain on American history. And I would take it a step back further to the American Revolution. And George Washington had a theory. And he said, we're not going to be like the Brits. And I refuse to spy on my citizens and censor their information. And that's when they created the US Post Office. And this is what makes a strong social society, because you need to have strong social discourse. And now that we're all one society, we all need to have strong social discourse. And we all should follow George Washington's lead. Um, important point, and I'd like to come back in a second to how the global trends are going in this regard. But let's talk about this hierarchy of threats. Okay. Are we too focused on terrorism? <clears throat> yes, I think so. Two things we, Japan, is good at is uh, controlling guns or banning guns. I mean, in the US, much, much more people were killed by guns than terrorism. Uh, you know, before talking about the metadata or, you know, wiretapping, they should do something about the gun control. The other thing we are good at is uh, immigration control, keep tracking of foreign workers in Japan. And uh, I think that probably a uh, higher priority. And we also worried about the terrorism, but uh, probably more so in the cyber world. Uh, ISIL probably ne may not be able to reach Japan and do terrorism just like in Paris. But uh, if they start cyber attack uh, on critical infrastructure, uh, the distance doesn't really matter. If we are not ready for it, Japan could be an easy target. So the Japanese police force is stepping up uh, measures against the cyber crime. So that, that's the hierarchy, I think. What do you think? Well, the fact that a threat is not existential is not a, 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 a reason why one shouldn't seek to, to counter it. If one only was going to counter existential threats to national security, uh, then one could disband uh, most of our police force and most of our army. So I don't see the, the existentiality of a threat as a reason why uh, we, we Well, let's we, we talk about the hierarchy of threats. Well, where does, where, uh, I where? think it all depends as to where you sit, of course. I mean, if you're sitting in Syria, uh, I think terrorism is a pretty high uh, threat to your local village and to your uh, municipal security, to oh, your okay. uh, regional UK, security. In the, in the UK? Uh, in, in the United Kingdom, uh, we don't have uh, a major international uh, security threat that is imminent and present, but we have to have armed forces to uh, defend our security and to uh, project power to protect our citizens abroad and also to engage in humanitarian interventions, the exploitation of, of citizens. There's a, a wide variety of uh, totally proper uh, purposes to which our uh, armed forces are, are being put. Our intelligence agencies work across a wide variety of, of, of issues. Um, now, um, a lot more foreign policy is, I think, informed by uh, um, uh, intelligence information than it might have been uh, in the past. By the way, it's very heavily uh, <coughs> lawyered. Um, about um, 40 years ago, MI6 might have had one part-time lawyer. Now there are probably 40 full-time lawyers that work in, uh, in, in MI6. We, in the United Kingdom, as in the United States, are a society of, of laws and of rules, and we can only operate our intelligence uh, agencies effectively with the, a strong public support, and that, that public support uh, exists. I do think uh, that um, terrorism is a very important uh, uh, security risk to the United Kingdom for the reason that, that Kel said, that in our European societies we have, unfortunately, a lot of homegrown jihadis, people uh, from communities that have been too separated uh, from society, that haven't been assimilated or integrated. We have strategic ghettos uh, in the United uh, uh, Kingdom where uh, people feel um, separated from the community and therefore have been uh, more uh, e uh, easily radicalized uh, over the internet or, or abroad. And our citizens expect us to be able to um, ensure uh, that those um, individuals don't go on to perform uh, terrorist acts in the United uh, Kingdom. In the last six months, I think probably seven uh, terrorist acts that might have created uh, important loss of life in London were uh, prevented by the intelligence services. That's a very significant number, seven uh, of the sides that took place uh, possibly in Paris uh, last November. So they're, 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 they're active against a very present threat. Well, no, and I don't think anybody's arguing, and certainly by posing the question, I'm not arguing that terrorism isn't important. But in the context of the US and in the context of your point, uh, the number of people who died in terrorist-related uh, incidents in the United States 
is one six hundredth of the number of people who died of gun-related mm -hmm. deaths, uh, and that it's half the number of people who died of, you know, diabetes. Sugar <laughs> is a much greater threat in the United States than terrorism, but we don't have the same kind of debate about it. Uh, There's a more compelling statistic, which I think uh, that 41 people were killed in the United States as a result of toaster accidents, and that's more <laughs> than were killed on behalf well, of terrorism. Toasters are, are very dangerous, and that's, that's actually the subject. The that's the subject of our next <laughs> panel. But yeah. But let me just remind you that the priorities of intelligence services are not priorities that the intelligence services make up themselves. They reflect, first of all, the political guidance here, uh, which again reflects the, the needs of the society, the needs of the people. So, uh, of course, the, the focus on terrorism here comes from um, the uh, psychological effect that terror has in a society, the fear that terror has made. Uh, just uh, think about the, uh, the fundamental changes to transportation, air transportation, that 9-11 made uh, globally uh, to us. That is why terror has such a high uh, priority and why we are expected to do something about uh, terrorism. Take okay. the incidents are just this year, beginning on the 1st of January this year, what, what happened just in, the, in these few days globally on a global scale so this is this is really a challenge and i'm afraid to say it will increase um, very much so our our membership the 190 member countries they they for sure they request us to provide support in three areas terrorism organized crime and cyber crime these are the main priorities where they expect us to provide support no and i and i again i'm not minimizing but for example cyber crime is an area where we haven't really touched upon this debate or touched upon it in little bits but but, but clearly, that's going to grow. And it's also going to change, it will the, tremendously grow. change the nature. In the big data world, everybody becomes a target. Uh, and the responsibility for defense against cybercrime is dramatically tilted in the direction of the private sector. And so you know, that, mm -hmm. that's going to change the balance in how one deals with some of these threats. Uh, and the private sector is going to have to know how to cope with that. Did, did you want to follow up? And, and, and when you mention uh, cyber here, I think that that illustrates a new area that is coming uh, into this. So far, a lot of focus has been on cyber crime, uh, but I think we need to look at cyber in a more uh, broader context and the, 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 the threat in cyber towards national security. And I think when we start understanding uh, the potential threats, the potential hazards that come with our interlinked digital systems, we will realize that the potential effect of um, uh, bad guys or, or state actors uh, operating in that domain uh, is, 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 is going to could have far broader implications than terror itself. Okay, so we've got four minutes left. And what I want to do is I want to go to each one of you and I want to give you 30 seconds. And I'd like you to make the case for one power that ought to be added to intelligence services because they need it and don't have it, or one power that ought to be taken away from intelligence services because they've got it and they don't need it. And then we're going to leave 30 seconds to poll you all again um, uh, on this uh, question that we opened with. So um, go ahead. We have to work against fragmentation of information. We have to, to better cooperate amongst law enforcement with the intelligence. There, there is still room for improvement. And uh, as this was mentioned and also was a topic here in, in Davos, we need to better cooperate uh, also with the private sector. Yeah, I would, I would underline the, the, your, your last comment there. I think um, a, a, a broader dialogue, more transparency uh, between law enforcement, government, intelligence, private sector is absolutely essential here. Uh, we need to um, keep that dialogue going uh, in order to understand the needs, um, uh, understand the challenges that we face. Um, so I welcome very much that. Can we put the question back up? now and so so I, I just want to give you a chance please vote so that when i get to the end of these three we've got the answer okay go i think intelligence services need to be trusted by the people and mm -hmm. uh, politics or politician need to sort of shouldn't use intelligence service to get into the dirty politics i mean the politics is polarized in many countries but the politicians shouldn't really uh, get the intelligence service into this, and uh, we need to get the confidence high. John. 
there needs to be a dialogue between uh, uh, intelligence agencies and the ICT community as to uh, what would be the circumstances of proper and proportionate uh, collaboration between the two. I think that'll still take some time. The United Kingdom uh, uh, had a special envoy to uh, the United States to talk about uh, this issue with the ICT companies, and I think uh, now the debate is beginning to uh, swing back in terms of a sensible relationship between uh, the United Kingdom's intelligence agencies, the United States intelligence agencies, and the ICT community. When the ICT community is is convinced that there is uh, a judicious uh, legal context in which specific interventions will take place. Thank you. Mika? Uh, I would say that the intelligence world needs to have less power in terms of putting holes in the web that impact us all. And they also need to do a better job of utilizing the holes that uh, the bad people have, uh, have in their systems, too, because it's a lot easier to own someone's phone than to break encryption that all of us use. Okay, super helpful. What's the result of the poll? <laughs> well, there we've, yeah, there's been a slight, <laughs> a slight uh, uh, return to sanity. No, there's been a slight, <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there's, been a, there's been a slight adjustment here uh, among all of you. Clearly, this is a complicated issue um, uh, it is, you know, uh, I do not by any means suggest that we ought to make light of, of uh, the threat that's posed by terrorism and, and the tools that we have are, are not necessarily adequate to, to meeting that threat right now. And I think we have some that we need to enhance. Uh, meanwhile, we should also beware the slippery slope uh, that has been the hallmark of the post 9-11 era that suggests that if a small group of people can inflict a large amount of damage on a big city, that any small group of people anywhere can pose a threat. Uh, because when you accept that argument, that anybody anywhere can pose a threat, then you begin to carve away at civil liberties in a way that's extremely dangerous for societies. We are going to face these problems in much greater scale as we move forward into this big data era, into this fourth industrial age. That's why this debate is so important. That's why it's so important that you take it home to all of your countries and continue it. Thank you very much to this great panel for a great discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>